Coming up on Tech News Today, I'm I'm actually not supposed to be here yet because I'm still on a plane flying back That's from right, Atlanta. That's right, Tom. Come on, so. get out of here. This is my, this is my tease. This uh, we're talking Hulu. We're talking T-Mobile and AT&T. Are they going to get married or not? People are mad at rim. Same old same. And Terpster's here. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is... Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, September 6, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and e easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For free trial and 10% off your new account for six whole months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT9. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we kick around the tech news of the day along with all of you and try to make some sense of it all. Tom Merritt is off today. He'll be back tomorrow. But we have someone even better. The other Tom Merritt. <laughs> yeah. well, Tom uh, Merritt's doppelganger, Mark Merit. Turpin. Yeah. All the I'm way from box. across the pond. Hey, Turpster. Hey, how's it going? Is it, I, have you had a nice week with your day off? Yeah, well, yeah. You know, the, one of the best things about having a three-day weekend is not only do you have the three-day weekend, but then the you following the week is week. short. Yeah. So it's almost like you get, mm -hmm. well, it's like a mental. double win. Yeah. Yes, we try to tell But what does it mean? Anyway. Who knows? No, it's Crazy. yeah, it's a real riddle. Well, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks, thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's good. Well, we always like having you. I know Joanna Stern is going to be pretty bummed. She was a little bummed. She couldn't make it. I did extend the offer. Oh, you good. Know, she has first right of refusal. So, when, for any, <laughs> yeah, for anyone who may be up in arms that Joanna Stern and Terpster aren't on the same show, we did try. Uh, She'll but be on soon, not though. hard enough. <laughs> exactly, not hard enough. Next time, we'll we'll make it happen. Yeah. All right. So, top story is probably something that isn't too surprising, although they didn't end up uh, beating the Department of Justice to it. Uh, Sprint has decided to sue to stop AT&T from buying T-Mobile. Yeah, they're suing under the Clayton Act, which gives uh, Sprint a private right of action so they can sue and try to stop this kind of transaction. And uh, Sprint's using some you know, nice words saying like uh, AT&T and the T-Mobile deal will be brazenly anti-competitive and transaction is a classic violation of antitrust merger law that would leave, this is a great one, a swath of victims in its wake. Ooh, sounds, mm. sounds painful. Yeah. I, just, I just think that you know, there's something called greed I mean, AT and T. It's already got two T's, and now they want a third T. Right. I just say no to that. You know, that's you know, I'm the T, um, and that's enough. You only need the one T. You know, I'll let them have T and T, but T and T and T mobile. It would just be stupid. It becomes ridiculous. You get in a series where people just think you've just you know got a sticky key or something. You know, your T's a bit rubbish. <laughs> Not Sprint sure also about that. says uh, the duopoly between AT&T and Verizon uh, would end up controlling more than three quarters of the market, 90% of the profit. So they certainly have a point there, although it's funny how Sprint is in this nice position where they can claim, listen, we've just got to think about the people, the customers. We're not going to screw up the American marketplace like this. But they also, uh, this is in their best interest interest as well. And they're lucky enough that they're not the ones who sued first. The DOJ already sued, so they're in a pretty good position, I think, because they're like, look, the, f the government doesn't think this is a good idea, and now we don't either. Yeah, they've been pretty vocal from this from the beginning of this. When we first heard about Can this, they've been always, uh, they've been a little up in arms, and AT&T, of course, has their response, which is another great one. This simply demonstrates what we've said all along. Sprint is more interested in protecting itself than it is in promoting competition that benefits consumers. And that's what AT&T said about Sprint trying to stop the merger. AT&T says a lot, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, but, this is yeah, not... They, fortunately, they can, though. They've got really good call plans, uh, so they can, they can just talk and talk and talk. So, you know, that's one of the benefits of being, you know, your own carrier. So, yeah, you can, ju you can just kind of say all sorts of stuff. Maybe if I change my Twitter handle to just, like, the underscore and sold AT&T my T, maybe then they wouldn't want T-Mobile's T and then everyone wins. Yeah, I'm sure that that would be just fine with them. That's a really good idea. Would you we also re that. request $39 billion or would you take that? They're all thereabouts, you know. I got to then call myself Erpster, which sounds like you've just, Erpster, sorry, just got a bit of gas, Erpster, you know, it's not the same. So um, yeah, I, 30, 39, you're saying, you know, three, I, I, I go for just an even billion. 
I'll just keep it. You know, I don't want to come across greedy. So the money issue, obviously, it's thirty-nine billion that AT and T wants to spend on T-Mobile. Should should the acquisition go through? But now at issue is this whole breakup fee. Okay, let's say for whatever reason AT and T is not allowed to buy T-Mobile. Both AT and T and T-Mobile want this to happen. There's a uh, six billion breakup fee. It's cash and assets in Spectrum um, that both AT and T thinks it should not have to pay, and T-Mobile thinks they have a right to get. Yeah, over the weekend, there were reports saying that Deutsche Telekom wouldn't get the breakup fee if the government intervened. And then Deutsche Telekom today was saying, no, we're entitled to that breakup fee even if the, if the government intervenes. So, of course, they want to get the $6 billion if this doesn't go through because this is, for T-Mobile, they have to pretend as if they're going to continue to exist even mm -hmm. though they don't want to. They'd rather take the $39 billion over the six any day. So... Uh, but 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 T-Mobile can't just lay down and die either because that's one of the loopholes that AT&T has said. Listen, if AT, uh, if T-Mobile goes under a certain valuation, you know, a perceived valuation of the future, then we could get out of this whole breakup fee because we want to buy them based on the strength of the company that's already there. So T-Mobile is in sort of this weird position where they've been trying to seem as weak as possible in order for this acquisition to go through, but they can't just stop trying. Yeah, the terms that they're the full terms of the deal of what gives Deutsche Telekom the the breakup fee aren't fully known. Right. So we're, we get to hear little bits of these things trickling out as they are squabbling over billions of dollars. Well, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know what to make of all of this. It, it doesn't look good for at and T. I I mean, I, I, I'm sure um, they, they won't go down without a fight, obviously, because they don't have to pay all this money. But it is, it is an interesting turn of events, uh, considering that when we all first heard about this, we went, well, this is kind of iffy. But these sorts of things don't really get shut down by the DOJ. So. I'm sure the UK is completely, they, they love this story, right, Terpster? This is, oh, this yeah, is the top yeah. story on, on every newspaper if they still have newspapers. There was there. some stuff <laughs> about Libya somewhere, yeah. but most of it was mainly just AT&T. Again, we don't have it over here, but like a lot of things, we wouldn't mind it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just wondering what, what that's going to mean See, for us. It's a little known fact that yeah. like the, the United States is obsessed with you know, the, the royal family and the UK is mm -hmm. obsessed with United States telecoms. AT&T. Yeah. We love, we just love any of your cellular networks. You know, there's some really cool ones. And like I was saying earlier, I mean, Sprint, that's what Jack Bauer uses. So I'd love that. You know, if I could have Jack Bauer's network, I would be awesome every time. You know, someone phones me up, I'd be like, Chloe, I need the blueprints. They wouldn't know that I was on Sprint, but every time that would make it special for me. So, um, yeah, I, I think we, we, we do long for the American networks. All right, on to some HP news. The WebOS Global Business Unit is being split into two units that will report to different HP divisions. So it's shedding a little bit more light on how they're intending to work this out. So WebOS software business is being moved inside HP's Office of Strategy and Technology, they call it os &T, which is headed up by Shane Robeson, who's HP's Executive Vice President, Chief Strategy and Technology Officer. WebOS Hardware Group remains within the Personal Systems Group under Stephen DeWitt, so they, they actually don't really move anywhere, which is HP's uh, formal name for the personal computer business, which has, uh, you know, been, been talked about being spun off into a separate company. We've obviously talked about this before, but these are new details on how HP intends to move people around. It sounds like the hardware group, I don't know, either they'll get reabsorbed into the company doing other things. I don't know if this makes it easier if they end up sort of folding that division later on because the software people are now moved away. But uh, I don't know. Does this make sense to you? Not particularly, because it sounds a lot like what happened with Palm. I mean, right. Palm was like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our software business, we're going to spin it off, and we're going to call that, I think, Palm Source. And our hardware company would be Palm One. And so we'll have our businesses really, really go really well. So what's going to happen, though, if, if, if history repeats itself, HP will buy themselves again, because that's how Palm ended up. Right. So anybody who th says, doesn't this sound like something Palm did back in 2003? Yes, in fact, Palm One uh, hardware division merged with Handspring. And then Palm Source didn't really go anywhere, ended up being bought by Excess, uh, mm -hmm. went Linux, didn't really go anywhere. Um, and if HGB is trying, it, it's, just, it's just weird. It's like, it doesn't mean that HP is going to have no success at all, but they are trying to get away from the issue of licensing software, with, which they're obviously very interested in doing uh, with WebOS and not making competing hardware, which is why they've shut down their hardware division.
And anybody who thinks, well, maybe because the touchpad has become such a runaway hit because they ended up selling it for almost free, I don't think mm-hmm. they're going to change their mind about that. It was a good deal, though. So, you know, if there are any left in a store near you, you can pick them up for next to nothing. I mean, admittedly, they're, they're not that great for, for much now. But still, you know, it's not bad for something. It also, it also sounds like the Office of Strategy and Technology is the right place for anybody who's in software development at HP right now. Um, the, it, it, from from uh, emails that are, uh, have been um, published uh, from, I think it was Stephen DeWitt and then um, Shane Robeson, uh, just letting employees know what's happening, where we're going, why they decided to do this. It sounds like... It makes a lot of sense for the software people to have a lot of access to the the rest of the uh, technology and strategy division, which is working on all sorts of things. Well, back when HP made its kind of its blundered press releases, no one really knew where WebOS was going. It could have been part of the personal systems group, which would which would make it pretty simple for the hardware company to make WebOS tablets and devices again. But then again, now finding this out, WebOS staying with what would be HP's per, not personal, the Office of Strategy and Technology. Theoretically, this company that spins out, the personal systems group, could license WebOS if they wanted to. And HP has been, they said this to me back when I was a reporter a long time ago. They've been doing software for a very long time. They can do this kind of thing. And what they're hoping is that if they continue to develop this WebOS, that not just, not just their old personal systems group will use them, but a lot of different companies will hopefully use the same operating system, assuming HP makes it viable. And with that real nice deal, they've installed, what, like 300, 500,000 of these devices out there already. I'm just interested in what the personal systems group is going to look like in a few months. It's hard to say right now. Well, printers. Yes, some of you. <laughs> well, they actually did Lots mention that, too. Lots of printers. We've got, we've got printers. Um, all right. <laughs> a RIM investor has uh, called for possibly the sale of the company or patents. This probably sounds familiar. Uh, Actually, it it is sort of a familiar story. Back in June, um, Northwest and Ethical Investments had asked to split the roles of chairman and CEO, which of course are shared by co-CEOs Jim Balsillie and Mike Lazaridis. So Vic Elbioni now, who is chief executive of Merchant Bank Jaguar Financial Group, who happens to be an investor in RIM, said in an interview with Bloomberg that RIM needs to create a committee made of independent directors, we've got to take this outside, to evaluate potential strategic options, which sounds a lot like sell things. Now, uh, he said in the interview, it's not just, he's not the only one who thinks this is the right uh, way to go. He has the support of several other shareholders who haven't been named, but collectively, here's the issue, hold less than 5% of RIM's outstanding shares. So they could squawk a lot about this, but RIM doesn't, less than 5% is not enough, um, I don't know, not enough well, power, is, I think, to make them do anything. The question is whether all, all the squawking will get other investors also angry exactly. in the long run. But then again, we've seen the co-CEOs basically turn a blind eye anytime somebody speaks with, I don't know, some kind of reason. You know, like, hey, maybe you want to get your, your business back in order. And they're like, no, everything's going fine. You've lost like 80% of your value. Right. Uh, no, we're fine. We're fine. So, I, I mean, it, w- would Rim be better off by breaking itself up and just calling it a day? I mean, I, I don't know if that's, it's, it's too soon for that. Well, I also think because intellectual property is a big deal uh, with wireless mm. right now, that anybody who's it's an so investor right it, it would, would love to see uh, some patents being sold and them getting some money out of that. Go ahead, Terpster. Yeah, I, I saw only on the on the news the other day that Google bought some patents, and everyone's everyone loves patents right now. They're like the the next big thing. I I can't wait. I you know I'm I'm waiting to like open a magazine and see like Paris Hilton's got a new patent or something like that. And I think everyone's <laughs> going to be going patent crazy, um, and it just seems like people have realised you know why innovate when you can just buy someone's patents and own other people's stuff. If you wait brilliant. long enough, RIM is going to be worth like what about a buck a share. So I mean, I don't, so maybe that's why <laughs> that's, these investors. I think that's also the investors are like, listen, things aren't really on the up and up right now. So why don't we yeah, take into consideration what our options are now? Well, we've got stuff that we can sell people that 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 is worth something. All right, RIM. 
the sun. You, you keep it's, things interesting. It's like Let's watching a train wreck right now. I mean, it, and these guys are like saying, hey, the investors are just saying, you, you got to try anything, something, something to, to make the investors money. Right. It, and if but it's sell off your business, well go do it. Like, <laughs> hey, guys, there's some lead on the roof. Should we go up there? I can strip that lead off. And I know a guy will give us a good, you know, a good price for that lead. Should we do that? Yeah. And everyone's like, yeah, come on, let's get some money. You know? Shoelaces. We've all got shoelaces. Let's sell our shoelaces. I just want to know how them. many RIM investors need to say, listen, RIM, you got to rethink some of the stuff. Let's see what our options are. Let's sell all some stuff before anything changes. Because Vic Albioni is not the first. I mean, we, we keep talking about this. People from within the RIM circle saying, this is not being run the right way, guys. Yeah, we've seen like major shareholders drop their shares entirely of RIM yeah. because this, this company, it, they're, they're kind of dumbfounding investors. Right. <laughs> All right. We're going to move on to uh, some latest news in the DigiNotar attack, uh, among other stories. But first, we want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this episode of TNT. If you're not familiar with Squarespace, go to squarespace.com because it gives you a really good idea for how to use, um, a, a build and use a really high quality website or a blog. Uh, we don't want to call it a blog because that's just one of the things that Squarespace will allow you to do. You can you, know, you have beautiful photo galleries. You can, if you're a real social media person, you can have really cool uh, Flickr or Twitter widgets, just to name a couple. Um, it, Squarespace is optimized for people who know nothing about CSS, who are like, I just want to set up a blog. I don't even want to think about it. I just want it to look nice with absolutely no effort on my part. Or, you know, maybe you're an expert. Maybe you really have a custom design um, that you want to bring to life. Squarespace is good for pretty much everybody. Uh, they have iPhone and iPad apps for updating your blog on the go. I'm a Squarespace user and I love their iPad app. In fact, um, I use a lot of um, comment, co comment uh, moderation. I almost prefer it on my iPad because I don't know, I get a, a good feeling when I kind of zap stuff that I don't it's want. It's a magical there. device, exactly. <laughs> when you actually poke someone out of existence, you're like, yeah. I like that. Power. Yeah. That's what that is. Right. Well, I like Squarespace as well. I think what I like more are people who don't know how easy Squarespace is because you show them your website and they're like, oh my God, did you make that? And you're like, yeah, I made that. They're like, that's amazing. And you're like, you know, it was like six clicks, but they don't know that. And exactly. they think you're really good. Right. It's and brilliant. so you say, thanks so much. Yeah, I, I've... I've really well, been I'm investing just, heavily in CSS. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty big deal. Uh, so there's a blog module. If you're already a WordPress user or a blogger user, one of those other blogs, Squarespace makes it really easy to import. So if you spend a lot of time on another blog service, don't worry. You can bring everything over to Squarespace. You don't have to lose anything. You don't have to you know, spend several months trying to I don't know, make, make your pictures uh, import correctly. And, mm. and they won't uh, keep your information hostage either. There's a nice export option as well. So that gives you a sense of how uh, confident Squarespace is that they're the right service for you. Um, what I particularly like uh, with them is um, they give you really good stats. Um, their their back end is great. I have a really good idea of who's coming to my site, where they're coming from, uh, what time of day people like to come, yeah, all that good stuff. So uh, Squarespace, we, we couldn't love them more. We thank them so much for uh, sponsoring this episode of TNT. And there's a special, because there always is with us, 10% off your new account for six months at squarespace.com if you use the offer code TNT8. That's the number eight. Nine. TNT8. Oh, nine. 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 Sorry. It's September. That's fine. TNT9. Don't listen to me. Listen to IS. <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> Thanks to Squarespace. Something. All right. Uh, so now we're coming to your favorite story of the day. Yeah, the lightest story that we will cover this all day. This is a day. tough one. Yeah. yeah okay. So uh, a hacker uh, who calls himself the Komodo hacker has claimed credit for the DigiNotar attack that we covered a couple times last week. Mm -hmm. Um, so, again, more light is being shed on what exactly happened. Right. So, what we have is we have a paste bin post from the guy who, under the account Komodo Hacker, obviously, he says he, he also did the Komodo hack a couple of, uh, I guess it was earlier this year. Mm -hmm. uh, he says he's a 21-year-old Iranian student. And uh, if you remember, DigiNotar was issuing certificates to a whole bunch of companies that weren't Google.com and add-ons.mozilla.com. So, basically, people could intercept all kinds of data, and that was a real problem. Now. There's a lot more data that we keep getting uh, as the day kept going on. We have, uh, we have, according to the chief executive of Komodo, he said the DigiNotar attack, they think, is a state-sponsored attack. And Trend Micro has concluded that Iran is behind the attacks to spy on Iranian users. So it, it's Iran theoretically spying on itself. And it's, it's, the real question is, what was the, the so motivation? Meta. Yeah, it's kind of meta. Uh, on top of that, the, in the paste bin uh, document, the hacker claims that he was doing this as retribution 
for the Dutch military's failure to protect I have Srebrenica. Srebrenica during the Bosnian War. Right, where, which is this is sort of the genocide situation mm -hmm. back in 1995 that where uh, over 8,000 Bosnian Muslims were killed. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is, which, which is strange because, okay, so this is like, okay, Dutch company, this is retaliation against the Dutch, but it ends up being a bunch of Iranian, uh, civilians who have had their, uh, their security compromised. So I guess it's not really much different than a lot of the other hacking attacks where it ends up being normal people who have all their passwords and names out there, but it's against the company who didn't do a good enough job of, of keeping things tight and locked down. Yeah, it looks like over 300,000 Iranians have had their email compromised, and the hackers weren't just looking at Google, by the way. There's also intelligence agencies like uh, sys.gov.uk, cia.gov, and I think MI6 is also involved in this. Yeah, I, it's, 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 this is a hard, it's a tough story. Yeah, and we were, I mean, we were doing some research before the show, and it's like, oh, man, I mean, you, you almost have... It, the first question is, is this guy or girl, a uh, woman or man, telling the truth? I mean, is this really the person that was responsible for all of this? Right, because the and case spin so, says he's a one person acting alone, and Trend Micro thinks, not Trend Micro, Komodo thinks it's a state-sponsored attack. Exactly. And Trend Micro also agrees with that, so it's really hard to tell what exactly is going yeah, on. Yeah, the first question is, what, what really happened? And if you believe these various um, stories, then you, do you even believe their reasons for, their, their motives? Um, so yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a complicated situation, but definitely worth reading up on because it's, you know we should we should know what happens eventually. All right, moving on to <laughs> television. Well, the next hey, generation television. of television, anyway. Hulu. Who's going to buy Hulu anyway? Because it looks like Directv has dropped out of the race, the race to buy Hulu. So who's left? Um, DirecTV is out. So who do we have left now? Amazon, Yahoo, and Dish Network. Right? Those are the three. Uh, companies that are still in the bidding process and Google. for Hulu and Google. That's right. So now, what is now? We, we've heard that Directv has dropped out. That's according to the Financial Times. But Peter Kafka at All Things D was saying that Google's bidding on Hulu, but not as it stands, because right now Hulu's just you know selling ownership. Google apparently is offering a lot of money, but Kafka Once can't so can't say exactly what extra they want. Now the theory is that Google would want like maybe exclusive rights, maybe they want to be able to continue to have access to these things longer than whatever deal Hulu's offering right now. So Google getting it would probably mean some kind of Hulu YouTube inter integration, which mm -hmm. is hard to say. Or the other favorite right now is Amazon. Well, and of course, CEO, Hulu CEO Jason Clare used to work at Amazon. So you have to assume that he and Jeff Bezos are probably chummy and maybe they have a nice, um, in a perfect world scenario of the two companies uh, getting together. Then there's Yahoo, and it's like, uh, Yahoo, I don't know. No, it, it's sort of like th this would make Yahoo be attractive it's to people. It's consistent maybe, to, for Yahoo to buy stuff that they have no idea what to do <laughs> with, right? <laughs> or, maybe, or maybe could enhance the Yahoo brand. And then you've got uh, Dish Network, and it's a little weird because we, were, we, we talked about what Bloomberg reported last week, which is that Dish is launching a, uh, a, a subscription streaming service under a Blockbuster brand uh, that's supposed to launch in October. And even have uh, movies from Stars, and Stars just pulled out of Netflix. So you think, well, isn't Dish have their hands full already? But if you were to combine the two as a blockbuster Hulu franchise, they just dropped that blockbuster name. Nobody wants that. Thing. I know. I don't know why they want to keep the blockbuster name either. Hulu Buster. Hulu Buster. Terpster, which which business do you think should buy them, and what's going to benefit you guys um, worldwide? I like I like Amazon uh, buying it because Amazon have this fantastic track record of, um, you know, they sold books and then they introduced the Kindle and tried to basically make books extinct. And by buying Hulu, they can kind of get rid of a lot of kind of the need for DVDs and all that goes along with physical media in TV and film. So um, I would like to think that Amazon can uh, try and destroy stuff. And we just have bits and bytes rather than things. But then we've got this Google, uh, Gulu, Google. 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 <laughs> Although that could be now, the new name of the service, Gulu. It's great. Yeah. We've got Google as sort of the dark horse saying, listen, we want totally different terms than what you'd like to offer, but we'll pay you more. I would love Google We have all the money in the this. world. I mean, at, last we, thing, yeah. Because YouTube Google. was supposed to kill, uh, I mean, Hulu was supposed to kill YouTube. And for Google to end up buying Hulu would be like this kind of this poetic justice of, yeah, you didn't kill us. We just bought you out. And mm -hmm. we're just going to enjoy this yeah. on YouTube. <laughs> that would be good. Who, who tube? 
Hutu. Yulu. I don't know. I think Gulu is the <laughs> Gulu. <laughs> Gulu is the winner. He said it by accident. I think that's the winner. Uh, com- coming to a horror movie near you, Gulu. All right, let's move on to a bit of a uh, a rumor mill. Sure, you must love that rumor mill because because we spell it in that funny way that you guys spell it over there. Yeah, do you do you not spell that that way normally? You don't bother with the U. No, nah, we try to we try well, we to keep uh, one U in it. Yeah, we don't have two. In why yeah. why use a keystroke you just don't need? We're busy people. All right, so we're, we're more personal though. We like to put you in the center of a lot of our words. Oh yeah, you know? by rumors. Just Always like you're in our hearts you and and our souls. iPhone 5 reservation coupons are coming from Deutsche Telekom today. Uh, Deutsche Telekom says this is in anticipation of supply bottlenecks. So that means what first could of all, it mean? T-Mobile doesn't have. I mean, this is a company that owns T-Mobile. T-Mobile doesn't technically have the iPhone yet. So that pretty much confirms that, I think. You think it's happening? T-Mobile, iPhone? Five? Well, I mean, if, if this is in Germany, then yeah, I sure, maybe. I, and, you know, the iPhone yeah. 5 is coming, right? Yeah, and it, it'll be out SIM-free as well, so they can just buy them in bulk and then sell them on. Genius. Quid's in. Yeah, I, I, I'll go with this. Sure. That sounds great. Uh, Plus, if you, I'm also doing iPhone 5 vouchers. Um, so if <laughs> you want to just give me... They're seven hundred dollars, but just send me seven hundred dollars. I'll send you the voucher, and then once the uh, the iPhone comes out, um, you get one. Best Buy is now uh, jumping on board with this whole iPhone five thing by preparing to take pre-orders for a Sprint compatible compatible iPhone five beginning sometime this month. This is according to Boy Genius Report, uh, with availability set for the first week of October. So people are like. What? Oh my gosh! iPhone Sprint? It's really happening. Best Buy confirms. I can't believe it. But then a source uh, told of within Best Buy told Mac Rumors that no, no, people are reading this all wrong. This October 21st fixtures are for iPads, not iPhone 5. These are for displays. The leaked calendar is actually for an iPad display, and people are just reading this information wrong. They just want to show off more iPad Wait, there's, units. There's more, because the Sprint lawsuit against, uh, to, to stop the whole merger with AT&T T- T-Mobile, uh, so that's hard to say, all those T's there. I know, it is, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, it's a, it suggests that T-Mobile will be, I mean, Sprint will be getting the iPhone, so... Best Buy is either telling the truth or lying, or they don't have any idea what's going on. So Sprint probably getting the iPhone. Could could there be sources within Best Buy saying to uh, Mac Rumors, no, 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 this is not about the iPhone, but secretly knowing that it is. But is that just the guys on the Geek Squad? Like, when they say sources within Best Buy. <laughs> exactly. I just imagine it's like, you know, the guy who works on a Sunday, and he's like, oh, guys, no, it's, it's totally about the iPad. And, you know, he doesn't have any idea. He's just, you know, no one knows. No right. one has a clue. Or just somebody random in the Best Buy. It doesn't even have to be somebody yeah. that works there. Sources in yeah. a Best Buy. In, it's like, it's like if I go to Best Buy, buy and someone says, Your what, do you, what do you think there's going to be, iPhone? I say, yeah, yeah sure. I do. And I'm wearing a blue shirt, and they don't know the difference. They think I work there. Uh, another uh, rumor mill. This, this is the one Obviously. that won't ever, ever, ever die. Hey, is Apple going to launch a TV set? Wouldn't that be neat? Boy, I think they're probably going to do that. It's going to happen. It's I the, think it's, so. You do? Oh, yeah. Well, okay. Just because so it won't go it, away. This rumor won't go away. I'm going to say it's happening. Is it going to happen in the next six months? Yes. In our lifetimes. I don't know if your lifetime will go beyond six months, Terpster, but... Uh, I don't know. I hear My liver old. won't, but I'm going to do a Steve Jobs. So if anyone out there has any money uh, or doesn't, then they can exchange their liver for money. So get All right, in so we have a TV set in, within six months. Mm-hmm. We have a TV set within Terpster's lifetime, which may or not be but very hang long. On, though. Like, is it just people who see the words Apple TV and don't understand what an Apple TV is and think, oh, they're making a TV. Well, I think I think for a lot of people, it's the next next logical step, because right now, for example, I could watch Netflix through my Apple TV, but I can also mm-hmm. watch Netflix through my TV because my TV has a variety of widgets. So if you've got an Apple OS inside your TV and you don't have a need for a box, and it gives a nice seamless experience then that's better for Apple because it's not some sort of an add-on device to, you know, maybe a cable subscription that people are already tied to. You get more used to having a TV that's Apple branded. 
through and through. Yeah. But I, I just find that they're all about the mobile stuff at the moment. Like you see less and less static equipment from Apple. You know, it, their biggest business is their mobile division. You know, all of the iPhone and the iPad and the iPods and all of that. I just can't see them needing a TV. I, I use a TV less than ever thanks to Apple. Well, people didn't um, need an iPad either. That's the whole thing. I don't think need is, is, is the operative word in this thing at all. Cause that's, uh, Apple. So it's going to be aluminium and exactly. glass, and I'm going to want it. it just, okay, so. I, the weird thing is, I don't know how people don't just think, okay, if the iMac gets really big, mm -hmm. it's a TV. At some point, it becomes a TV. At 27 inches, it's almost a TV already. If, right. you, if you put a different, uh, different skin on the <laughs> OS, it's the same thing. Uh, so the reason why I keep thinking this is going to happen is because Steve Jobs has said it like several times. First, Apple TV is a hobby, and nobody wants a set-top box. So it, Steve Jobs is all about eliminating stuff. Buttons and, and now set-top boxes will somehow magically integrate into one... Well, I imagine, screen. you know, when, when I first got the iPad, AirPlay was something that we talked a lot about, mm -hmm. but nothing really worked, and now it's like the new thing. I mean, I'm always sending a lot of stuff to my TV, but it's not a seamless process. It's kind of clunky still. So you can imagine that Apple would love to just be wherever you're... Um, you're watching your media, whether it's your iPhone, you know, in the mo in the mobile world, or your iPad somewhere in the middle, or your TV. You don't need all of that extra stuff. Is it going to look like those display iPads they have in their stores in the windows? You know, those massive fake iPads? Because I've gone in there several times asking to buy one, and they keep <laughs> That's using. probably what caused the demand. Right? Well, exactly. They're probably like, hang on, this guy wants them. I wonder how many others. Let's, let's, let's call it ITV. Uh, to Go round on. out the Apple rumor mill, are they going to put USB 3.0 alongside Thunderbolt in future Macs? There's a report that says that prices for USB 3 host controllers are at an all-time low. They're around two to three a piece when bought in bulk, and in comparison, uh, it's about ten to fifteen per uh, for a Thunderbolt chip. So, quite a bit uh, less expensive, slower, but kind of a good deal. It's a, it's almost like is Apple just silly not to to grab this while while the getting's good. They're not going to do it. I mean, they took how long to put SD cards in the SD card slots in, in in machines? They're not adding USB 3.0. No. Nope. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Terpster, what do you think? Going to happen? Well. Thunderbolt's a much better name, so that f instantly makes it a preferable connectivity source. And Apple have this weird heritage of, like, they had FireWire, they still have FireWire, even though no one really uses FireWire. I mean, I guess professionals in the video industry do, but they put it on everything anyway. So, um, yeah, I can't see them putting USB 3 on there because uh, until it becomes more mainstream. So I'm not saying never, because um, obviously they'll replace USB 2 with USB 3 eventually, um, but I don't think for ages, not for ages. Yeah, I agree with you. I, Apple has a hard time. Once, they, once, they, once they've got momentum, I could just see Apple say, no, it's Thunderbolt. That's what it is. And that being really said, in, in Europe, they've, uh, they've signed up to the whole, uh, we're going to charge our iPhones using uh, mini USB. Um, so maybe they want to, maybe they'll transition to just USBs in the future. Who knows? Uh, Terpster, this is kind of uh, awkward, but you've got a, you got a, thing a sort of a growth um, coming out of your, <gasps> your, your monitor. Oh my gosh. Uh, what the? I, this has never happened to us before. I'm, I'm so terribly sorry. Didn't you guys move on to the news view so I can get the frame right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I should. Hang on. So... <laughs> Is he just avoiding the show because of me? Because this is... <laughs> we were under the impression that Tom was on an airplane. He wouldn't be able to get here in time. We were feeling Happy so, oh, he's just... Terps, oh, yeah. that day of travel. <laughs> Poor Tom. Tom's hanging out here. He's probably been in the kitchen he's eating chocolate all day. Outside. Thanks exactly. for nothing, Merritt. I think I Thanks spotted a daiquiri in his hands. I think I he smelled a daiquiri that. on his breath. <laughs> all right, let's move on to the news. Views. Get a backhandery if he does that. <laughs> Two people in Mexico may be facing up to 30 years in prison because of their tweets. The two posted messages that said kidnapping and shootouts were occurring near Veracruz schools, which sparked a citywide panic, obviously. Many people ran to schools to save their children. However, there were no shootings or kidnappings, and now the two face charges of terrorism and sabotage. Amnesty International says the arrest violates freedom of expression. In news that will surprise few, the MPAA and RIAA attempted to infiltrate file sharing sites according to a document released by WikiLeaks. The industry groups came up with this strategy to leak music before the release dates to build trust with where seen to get access to its servers. So if you were paranoid about all those files that may be RIAA, well, you were right. 
Amazon's latest gadget has a touchscreen and probably weighs, um, I don't know, a couple hundred pounds. Uh -huh. Amazon <laughs> has installed a delivery locker at a 7-Eleven store in Seattle. The unit has around 40 drawers, and Amazon would deliver your purchases into the locker. You'd pick up your order by entering a pin. Uh -huh. So no more missed packages. It's like a uh, safety deposit box-ish. I like it. No more stupid little tags and you missed something. Yeah. Steven Sanofsky wrote over 1,000 words defending Microsoft's decision to include the ribbon in the Windows 8 interface. He says that, quote, the dislike of the ribbon is most intense in the audience of this blog, but notes that the vast majority are pleased with the ribbon interface. Sanofsky pretty much is just saying no. you can't please everybody all the no time. No one, no one likes the ribbon. No one liked it. It never has been liked. They're just saying it because they like it. You know, I'm sure, you know, in every measurable metric, You just said nobody better. does, so somebody must. Yeah. Somebody, somebody likes the must. ribbon. Focus and I want that person to every, stand up. But every us. measure, I'm sure, is a better interface for whatever reason you want to come up with. But nobody likes the ribbon. It's confusing and it changes. You know, I'm trying to find something. It's not where it was in 1997. What the hell, Windows? What the hell? Well, we have some ribbon lovers in chat, so I, I, I knew you guys were out there somewhere. Uh, be proud of the ribbon. Um, it's, it's, it's for you, I guess. Over the weekend, several sites, including UPS, the Daily Telegraph, and the Register, were hacked. If you went to either, any of those sites, you got a graphic with a message proclaiming September 4th as World Hackers Day and hacking is not a crime in lead speak. The hackers changed the DNS records of the sites. Now they look back to normal, so tee hee, Labor Day lulls. Sony just hired former U.S. National C Cybersecurity Center Director Philip Redinger as Senior Vice President. In case you have a really short memory, Sony's PSN was the subject of a massive security breach. Uh, of the hire, a spokesperson for Sony said, certainly the network issue was a catalyst for the appointment. Last week, Microsoft was hit with a lawsuit claiming that Windows Phone 7 was transmitting location data without users' permission. On Monday, Microsoft officially responded by denying these claims and says the company is investigating. Microsoft says it's value, it values its customers' privacy and that any data on Windows Phone can't be connected to a particular user or device. Not the, surprising. The much-anticipated Groupon IPO may be delayed, according to the Wall Street Journal, citing a person familiar with the matter. Groupon may not be so gung-ho about going public because of stock market volatility. The source also said Groupon's original plan was to issue an IPO in mid-September, but that's on hold for now. Well, the problem with that, though, as well, is that um, if, you, if you just wait a while, uh, Groupon's actually going to have an offer on Groupon uh, where you can get, like, three shares for the price of one. So it's worth just holding back on that. Finally, Reddit and Condé Nast are breaking up. Yeah, it's Splitsville oh. for the two. Condé Nast has decided to spin off Reddit as its own company, but will own the entirety of the new company. So the theory is that Reddit is going to be able to grow in a way that it couldn't under the, the dark and sinister umbrella of Condé Nast. Now, that, that, those are just my words. Condé Nast uh, isn't actually dark and sinister. But they could, they, <laughs> Reddit couldn't grow if the current setup was maintained. So Reddit is going to gain its own board of directors, which includes Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanian. Kind of reminds me of another story in the news right now, but different. Spinoffs are all the rage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and finally, the randomizer. Randomizer. I keep saying finally as if our show is ending, but we just have more things to talk about. <laughs> and there's after finally. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> finally, but Another not really. Finally. Ayaz, do you think you have the exercise gene? No, not at all. No? No. Exorcise? No, you know, like oh, running. Exercise. Okay. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I've never the seen power uh, I has exercise the demons. Researchers at McMaster University say. They've been able to fi possibly find an answer to why some people seem to have all the energy in the world and they can run marathons and they, you know, they want to get up in the morning and exercise, and other people just don't have it in them. There may be a key gene that's linked to exercise. Uh, the McMaster team was working oh. with mice. Some of the mice had two genes removed, and the genes control the AMP-activated protein. Uh, Kinase. Yeah, it's an enzyme that's released during exercise. And mice like to run, but the mice without the genes were not as active as the mice with the genes. With sweatpants. Now, if we... Oh, we, uh. Right, exactly. <laughs> when you're wearing sweatpants, you're just not active. Exactly. You're it's, just like, it's very similar to humans. I need my exercise genes on if I'm going to do some motion. But I am wearing the sweatpants. I am sitting down. 
I went ahead and voted um, at this uh, article at um, cbc.ca, and I said, uh, no, I don't think I have the exercise gene, just to get to, get to the poll results. And uh, most people say, no, we do not believe we have the exercise gene because we're lazier than we should be. Um, that was about 38%. Uh, 27% said, yes, I think I do. 16 weren't sure. And 17% said, I don't think there's such a thing as the exercise gene. <laughs> but I think it's a great excuse. It's a, yeah, I wasn't born that way. Forget it. <laughs> right, yeah. It takes time to get I this. don't have the exercise gene. What do you want me oh. to do? It's out of my <laughs> hands. I always, doubt, I always doubt a tough, a tough hand, really. You know, I'm big boned. Right. Um, and I don't have the exercise gene. It's, it's not your fault at that it's, point. It was never my fault. That's a brilliant thing about, you know, advances in science, really, is each day they discover another excuse for me. And uh, for that, I thank them. Cheers. All right, let's move on to the calendar. Bill Kunkel, who's the original gaming journalist, has died at the age of 61. If you're not familiar with him, he was a big deal. He had the first regular column about games called Archive. Arcade Alley in video magazine way back in 1978. In 1981, he and two of his partners founded Electronic Games, which was the very first magazine devoted to games. So I know a lot of gamers are uh, sad to see Bill go. On Monday... I would have my gravestone insert coin um, and ooh, just, that's uh, a good one. just on there. I would like that. That'd be good. That's a good one. Obviously, no one would and uh, because, you know, all games are filled with zombies these days. So who wants another? Be, be silly. Oh, hey, Tom. It's nice to see you again. What, what you got there? What do you have there? Good in my mail. Oh, okay. Is this Mr. Rogers' neighborhood? Uh, maybe you were here. bringing me a, <laughs> some sort of a mimosa. I thought he was going to turn me hey, off. vacation's yeah, over, just, buddy. Ow. I don't know what world you're On living the in. The rest of us actually <laughs> work for a living. Oh, oh, there, there you go. All right. Yes, everyone can see Tom's drink. <laughs> Get out of here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> On Monday, Netflix rolled out its service to Brazil, which is just the beginning of a huge rollout to 43 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean um, uh, by September 12th. Uh, Terpster, you might want to think of relocating yeah. to maybe a nice yeah. warm island and getting, don't, don't uh, mind getting some Netflix. We, we, yeah, we've got terrible currency over here. Don't, don't bring your streaming service to us. What would we do with it? Right. Oh, terrible. In all fairness, though, it's another reason to go to Brazil. That's which right. Is good. Yeah, Brazil, lovely country, and uh, yeah. and now they have Netflix. In nice weather, Netflix, no excuse. <laughs> Starting today, BlackBerry App World 3.0 is available for BlackBerry OS 7 devices. Uh, Thursday, September 8th, the BlackBerry Torch 9850, that's the one with the 3.7 inch touch screen touch screen and 1.2 gigahertz Snapdragon processor is going to become available on Verizon's online store. It'll be 200 bucks, and then brick and mortar stores get it on the 15th. On to the email, TNT at twit.tv. We got an email from Andrew, and he wanted to give us a point of view about the T-Mobile AT&T merger, basically calling it a monopoly on GSM coverage, because in the United States, AT&T and T-Mobile are the only two companies that have GSM, and if the two companies merge, they're going to have the monopoly on GSM. Even this is going to affect not just the United States people, but everybody who comes in with GSM phones. Mm -hmm. And he discusses a, an example with the three mobile carriers in Australia, and that all works fine because they all have GSM. You can swap your phones, but that will totally change things if this merger goes through. So thank you, Andrew. So that's actually a that's a side of the story that we didn't cover earlier mm -hmm. in the show, and it's a I don't know it's a it's a pretty valid argument. Although theoretically, if everybody moves to LTE even though they're incompatible band with, uh, bands, it's all awful anyway. Terpster, what do you think? If you have a G GSM phone well, and do, you come I to the US, all right. whenever I come to the US, I get put on either T-Mobile or AT&T. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really makes no difference to me uh, because my phone switches between whatever's there mm -hmm. and decides to ch you know, charge me just an exorbitant amount of money. So either way, I get screwed. So I, you know, if, they, if, if, if this buyout, meant that they did a deal and I didn't have to pay so much, then brilliant, I would be for it. But um, I don't think either way it makes any difference uh, to anyone traveling in. Mm, you heard it from a guy in Except for the logo. The logo in the top left-hand corner of your iPhone, if they did go through with it, it would only ever say AT&T. Right, and which one do you prefer? T-Mobile takes a little bit more screen real estate. It does, yeah, it does, true. exactly. And so that's something on a, to think about. They have nice like caps. You know, mm. T-Mobile, they have this, the T and the M. <laughs> Fever caps. Right, the AT&T is really bold in your face <laughs> yelling at you, AT&T, you know. <laughs> All right, second email from Florian Bear. Uh, hi, T&T crew. I noticed recently you talk a lot about Netflix and how Europe doesn't have video streaming. 
I'd like to clarify some things. It may seem from an American standpoint as if Europe is just one big market like the U.S. is. And while this may be true for some manufacturing and big corporations, it's not true for customer services and products. Every country has developed its own set of brands before it was possible for corporations to expand to other European countries. So just as important is the fact that a lot of different languages are spoken in Europe, which makes it difficult, especially in movies and TV, to be a European company. Um, then he goes on to explain a uh, current situation, uh, streaming situation in Germany. We've got two big streaming video services, Maxdome and Telecom Entertain. Maxdome is very similar uh, to, to Netflix. Um, and uh, episodes of TV shows are usually available for streaming one week before the air. Entertain, on the other hand, is a complete internet TV via set-top box. All channels come through your broadband. You can use it as a DVR and also access their video on-demand services. He says both services have their problems, but it's not like we're living in the Stone Age. Well, Florian, we know that. I hope we don't make it seem like we think Europe is living in the Stone Age at all. I thought they were in the Bronze Age, at least. Bronze Age, yeah, definitely. Bronze Age. We've sh we've started to shape metals, and uh, you know we've got some pretty pointy ones. So watch out. <laughs> you know. But thanks, Florian. It's it's always um it, it's nice for us to be reminded how how some things uh are structured, particularly in Germany. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we want to thank everyone who contributed to our subreddit, Tech News Today at dot reddit dot com rather. Um, this is where you can submit stories or just vote stories up and down and help us pick our lineup every day. Uh, Sid Harthasani, The Moke, Z Golf, Psych One, Lord Necron, Pat Factor X, Capt Kipper, you're always in there. Capt Kipper. You're getting you're up off. votes. I'm going to upvote you all. And everybody else, thank you so much for contributing. We really, we really love your input. Um, it helps us know what you want to hear about. Derpster, thanks so much for joining us. Now, I, I, oh, you, you, you. you haven't said anything about oh. what may or, what, what, what's, just, just tell, what, what's going on tomorrow. Your own personal calendar, if you will. Tomorrow is my birthday. <gasps> Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. Well, I mean, the thing is, is I had a word with Obama and what we did is we rolled it into Labor Day. So I don't know if that was communicated properly for you guys, but you're welcome. You know, you got that, you got that day off uh, yesterday, but tomorrow is the actual birthday. Wonderful. So yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be very special. Um, on Twitter, please use the code happy birthday um, and you'll get 100% off respect from me. So yeah, thank you. Yes, definitely go to twitter.com slash the underscore T to send Terps to her all your birthday wishes. Thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's always good fun. All right. All right. Tomorrow's guest, Ryan Block of GDGT.com, is going to be joining us. That is it for this edition of TNT. Uh, 260 TNT shows the number. Uh, TNT at Twitter.tv is the email address. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. Tom will be back, even though he's already More here. More so than today. Not drinking. He might be less drunk. At merit. This was a show with merit.